Flight 571 hit a mountain ridge at an altitude of about 3,600 meters. It's October 3rd, 1972. The tail and a section of the wings snap off on impact and tumble down a slope. What exactly happened that afternoon? Many of you have probably seen the movie Society of the Snow that even got an Oscar nomination for Best Foreign Film, but which, rightly so, concentrates more on the psychological and dramatic aspects of the tragedy than the technical ones. So I thought, why don't we tell the story of the disaster from a technical standpoint? In that way, we can fill in some of the gaps in the technical side of things that maybe the movie doesn't explain or perhaps only briefly touches on. Ciao ragazzi, this video was written and filmed in Italian by our team of scientists, storytellers and video makers, manually translated into English, but, but, dubbed with artificial intelligence. Long live culture and let's go back to the video. Before getting into that though, I'll do a quick recap for those of you who haven't seen the movie yet and obviously it'll contain a few spoilers. So, if you don't want to know how it ends, skip a few seconds ahead. The story's about a rugby team that needs to go from Uruguay to Chile, but at some point, the pilot's forced to change course. Along this alternative route, however, the plane hits a rock wall in the Andes and crashes into a snow drift. Many of the passengers consequently die, and the 16 left alive only manage to survive by resorting to cannibalism. In the end, they are rescued after a whopping 72 days of agony. But what made the pilot change course? Let's take a step back. Our story begins in Montevideo, which is the capital of Uruguay. The Christian Brothers rugby team is all geared up to head over to Santiago, Chile for a friendly match with a local team. To make the trip, they take the Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571. Back then, the Uruguayan military wasn't exactly flush with cash, so to make ends meet, they'd offer up their planes for civilian flights. In this case, the plane was a Fairchild F-27 a compact little aircraft with two turboprops and a wingspan of 29 meters. Keep the plane in mind, we'll come back to it. On October 12th, 1972, after taking on board the players, their families and coaches, 45 passengers in total, Flight 571 was ready to take off. First off, let's go and see what was supposed to happen theoretically, that is, if the accident had never occurred. In theory, the plane was supposed to fly from Montevideo to Santiago, Chile. It was actually a pretty straightforward flight that was expected to fly over the Andes and land at its destination in just a few short hours. The whole thing would have been a walk in the park, but unfortunately the pilots had the effects of El Nino to deal with. To understand the implications of that, we need to be aware that in the Pacific Ocean, the trade winds usually blow from east to west along the equator, carrying both warm air and warm water from the Pacific coasts of the Americas all the way to Asia. This happens because of the Coriolis effect which is caused by the Earth's rotation. Up to this point, everything is as it should be. But cyclically, every 5 to 10 years or so, although it varies considerably, the phenomenon known as El Niño occurs. In reality, El Niño is part of an extremely complex and even more extensive atmospheric phenomenon. What we're really interested in for the purposes of this story is that the presence of warm, humid air in South America caused some very intense weather phenomena. In fact, when these moist air masses come up against the very high peaks of the Andes and start to rise and condense, that's when little droplets of rain or snow form inside them, and this obviously causes bad weather all along the Andean range. That's exactly why, between 1972 and 1973, throughout the whole area, there were more extreme weather events than usual, including some heavy snowfalls, all because it was an El Nino phase. In fact, upon reaching the foot of the Andes, the pilot of Flight 571 with the rugby team on board realized that terrible weather conditions lay ahead of them and that it was impossible for their journey to continue as planned. Then, obviously, we can't be sure if that particular day of bad weather was directly related to El Nino or not, but I think it's quite interesting to take a closer look at what was happening during that time, also on a macro scale, to put that spell of nasty weather in mid-October into context a little better. Anyway, now that we've clarified that aspect, let's get back to the rugby team that needs to reach Chile. To get to their destination, the pilots were forced to take an alternative route. It was a longer journey, but in theory, the weather along the way was better. The new flight path had them fly first south to Malarg, which is still in Argentina, then they were supposed to cross the Andes just south of the Planchon Pass, emerging in Chile near Curicó, before finally heading back north to land in Santiago. So the pilots chose this alternate route, and as we'll see in a bit, it would turn out to be their downfall. 
At 2.18 p.m. on October 13, 1972, the plane took off from Mendoza and headed off on this alternate flight path. As soon as they got to Malargue, they advised that they'd reached the Planchon Pass by 3.21 p.m. As soon as they got to the Andes though, the pilots realized that there too, the weather wasn't exactly ideal for traveling, seeing as the mountain passes were completely covered by clouds. And this was a problem because they couldn't understand exactly where the plane was, so they had no way of knowing precisely when they'd be clear of the mountains to land. We also need to consider that, obviously, back in the 70s, the onboard instrumentation was different from what we've got now. Things were done more by sight. In fact, the plane wasn't equipped with a GPS system, so they didn't know their exact position. At the time VOR was used, conceptually, what did this tool do? It received signals from ground-based radio beacons. The information from the radio beacon allowed pilots to determine their position relative to the station, and with a calculation that included the plane's speed and the time since the last signal was received, they could work out their position with respect to the beacon. And that's just the problem. If the pilots made a mistake and miscalculated their distance from the beacon, they would no longer know where they were. In fact, the pilot, after receiving the signal from the Curico beacon, did the math based on his flight speed and was convinced that they had already crossed the Andes Mountains. So, he let the control tower know that he'd shortly be starting the descent maneuver, but he hadn't considered one thing, a small but extremely important detail. During the flight, you see, a strong wind had slowed the plane down more than the pilot had counted on, so the speed used in the calculation was off, and when the pilot started the descent, they hadn't cleared all the mountains like he thought they had. After breaking through the cloud cover, the pilot realized straight away that they were still in the middle of the mountains. At that point, he tried to avoid all the obstacles in his path by zigzagging between the rock walls, but suddenly a huge crash was heard and felt on board. The right wing of the plane had hit a peak, ripping right off and slamming into the tail end of the plane. Two passengers were thrown out. Soon after, the left wing was also torn off, its propeller slicing through the fuselage. The wreckage of the plane crashed onto a snow-covered slope and began sliding down it, only coming to a stop after colliding with a big drift of snow. It was around 3.34 p.m. and the surviving passengers found themselves at an altitude of more than 3,500 meters in what would from then on be known as the Valley of Tears. From here on out, the story is pretty much what they showed in the movie, but for those of you who haven't seen it, let me give you a quick summary. Following the crash, 12 of the 45 people on board lost their lives. The wreckage was surrounded by snow and ice, so the survivors had to first ration the food they had and then, unfortunately, resort to cannibalism to stay alive. As the days went by, some of the surviving passengers set out on brief expeditions in search of help, but they all seemed to end in vain. Until two of the survivors, Nando Parado and Roberto Canessa, after several days of trekking, managed to find a herdsman who came to their aid. Then they also had him call for backup, making it possible for rescuers to go back with a helicopter to save the rest of the survivors. Out of the 45 people on board, after 72 days, only 16 made it out with their lives, and of those, 14 are still alive today. All right, guys, thanks for sticking with me this far. I hope you all enjoyed the video. And if you know any other stories like this one that maybe you'd like us to explore from a technical standpoint, just let me know in the comments below. I'll catch you for the next video right here on Geopop Everyday Science.